know, the only time that I genuinely feel like I can quit social media, honestly, the only time I feel like I can quit social media is whenever there's a vote or an election or something like that. Because whenever that's happening, an amazing thing happens to my Facebook feed where all the friends that I've been curating over many years all of a sudden, just overnight, all magically turn into political fucking experts. <laughs> all with their own beliefs and ideas that you have to like and share and God forbid they ever disagree with you. Do these people not know that we know them the other 11 months of the year. We know that they're fucking idiots. Their opinion ain't worth shit. I was reading one about the evils of capitalism. I wanted to be, I was like, mate, you're not a political analyst. You work in a fucking garden center. <laughs> And last election, I got properly into it. And I'm not here to preach politics to you because I don't understand most of it myself. But the last election, I really got into it. I read all the manifestos. I watched the debates. I caught 15 minutes of question time. I was committed to making the right vote about who I thought was best to lead our country forward. And then the very next day, I overheard my sister telling her friend how she voted for the conservatories, and I thought, what's the fucking point? <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody should be allowed to vote, should they? There's some people, you can't trust them with that responsibility. There has to be a cut-off point somewhere where they go, you're, mate, you're a fucking idiot. Just, you have to put up with whatever us normal people decide. And my sister is so far beyond that line. Do you know, and whatever the line is, my sister is at least three miles to the left of it. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> She is. My sister's 33, by the way, and she's finally figured out what she wants from life. What she wants is she wants a house, she wants a husband, she wants children, she wants a family, and I think that's great. I support her 100%. The problem is that she's single, and she's been single for quite some time, and she can't seem to figure out exactly why she's single. I know why she's single. <laughs> See if you can work it out for yourselves. She will say something along the lines of, all I want is just like a really nice guy, somebody who's just really easy to talk to and who's on my wavelength and who has the same sense of humour as me and who gets me 24-7 and he's got to be good looking and have a nice body but not like goes to the gym every single day and only eats chicken and protein shakes good looking. Like I want somebody that if we were to have a pizza night that he wouldn't have to join CrossFit for a month to work that shit off. And he's got to be adventurous and like going outdoors and doing new things. I've always wanted to go hang gliding and parasailing but if we just wanted to stay in and watch Netflix, then we could just stay in and watch Netflix. And he's got to like the same books and films and arts and music and literature as I do. And he's got to drive a nice car, but not like a dickhead car. Like, like a nice car with sensible miles per gallon that he keeps valeted regularly on the outside and on the inside as well. And he's got to have his own house. So if not his own house, then the money's saved up towards his own house. So when we want to move in together, we can just move in together and there won't even be any issues. Shoes, and he's got a shampoo and conditioning, two separate processes. So he's got really smooth, silky hair, because I like running my fingers through guys' hair sometimes. And he's got a smell really nice, but not like an overpowering smell, just like a nice, neutral, clean sort of smell. Why can I not find a guy like that? <laughs> And I don't have the heart to tell her that the reason she can't find a man like that is because she is a six out of ten at best. <laughs> people are out there, but perfect people fuck other perfect people. They're not going to sully the gene pool with your big nose and your flabby tits. And I'm not having a go at six out of tens. If you're a six out of ten, that's absolutely fine. But you got to know your market, girl. And if you're a six out of ten, your market is other six out of tens. Five out of ten with a good job, seven out of ten with low self-esteem. <laughs> or an eight out of ten with 60% bell end. 
<laughs> you know what I mean there. It is a thing, isn't it? You know when you see like a couple in the streets and one of them's like an eight and the other one's like a two? <laughs> it feels weird, doesn't it? It feels like something's gone wrong. It's almost like you've got to stop yourself from going up to them and going, excuse me, sorry, sorry, sorry. What the fuck is this? <laughs> You're an eight and you're a two. How is that possible? <laughs> and people go, oh, well, he might be a really nice guy. He might have a really nice personality. He might be a really nice guy. Yeah, I'd be the nicest guy in the world if I was a two shagging an eight. I'd be holding open doors for strangers, helping little old women cross the street with their shopping bags. No need to thank me, madam. I'm fucking an eight. <laughs> That's why I like watching The Undateable so much. <laughs> no, I mean it, because on The Undateables, <coughs> on The Undateables, it's just two people who are looking for love and they don't care about anything else. There's no ego on The Undateables, is there? And I think we as a society could learn a lot from that. I have never once watched an episode of The Undateables where they meet each other for the first time in like a cafe or a restaurant and they sit down across from each other and one of them goes, Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I've got Asperger's, she's a head on a pillow, what the fuck? <laughs> 